Alex Sinbrot, your investigative reporter here with Tommy Tenney, and this is unlike any television show you've ever seen before because it's interactive. What do I mean by interactive? Normally you're used to sitting back in your couch and t kicking off your shoes and saying, come on, entertain me. Well, this is two-way communication, which the supernatural will literally go through your television set. People are going to be physically healed and physically touched by the presence of the living God. Now, my guest, Tommy Tenney, I believe, just as in the book of Esther, it says, who knows if you've not been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. The reason that I have him on this show is not because he has a best-selling series of books, The God Chasers. It's not because he's about ready to do a Hollywood motion picture with Peter O'Toole uh, on, on the book of Esther. It's not because his books on the Esther series are becoming bestsellers. It's none of the above. It's one reason and one reason only. Somehow, some way, Tommy Tenney has touched the heart of God. And where he goes, he walks in supernatural favor. And I believe that if we can talk to him and pull out of him what he has learned in his adventure with God, some of you will begin walking with God in an extraordinary fashion. As a matter of fact, Tommy Tenney, if someone was to say to you, what is the purpose of your life thus far, you would say? To find my assignment and fulfill it. And what is your assignment? I love to teach people about the presence of God and to give them a roadmap of how to enter His presence and what pleases God. Now, before you became a best-selling author, I have to believe that you experienced the presence of God and were probably teaching on it before anyone ever heard the name Tommy <laughs> Tenney, beyond little areas that knew it. Am Abs I right? Absolutely. I have been in ministry 32 years, and people only have heard about me about the past 10 years, and they said, you're an overnight success. And right. <laughs> I, I wanted to slap them and say, you have no idea how long that night was. It really is not about that. It's just that all of a sudden, I'm saying the same things. It's all of a sudden, everybody wants to listen. But God puts you through school so that you thoroughly learn what your assignment is and you stay on that theme. And God gives me particular themes to preach on and that's what I do. Was there, and not just preach, write. Was there a point in your life, Tommy, where you can say there was a measurable difference in your own intimacy with God and in the favor God put on your life? But they didn't come together. Explain. There was a sense of, uh, it, it was three phases, a sense of incredible hunger and ironically, Sid, it was nine months of that kind of hunger, hmm. birthed an incredible experience to which I can... Would you say that God put the desire, that hunger within you, or was it an act of your will? Oh, it was a, a combination of circumstances. God does not mind sacrificing our comfort to develop our character or point us to our assignment. and. I went through nine months of a frustrating period in my life and got so desperately hungry that I really prioritized God and all of a sudden He showed up in a way that unprecedented. I'd known God, I was saved, been in ministry nearly 20 years yeah, at no, that no, point. Just as you are saying that, I'm, I'm like most of us, can feel the presence of God. And just as you said the word unprecedented, I felt the presence just zoom right up. Just as you said that, I guess just remembering what God did. I have some interesting experiences, Sid. I'm in airports all the time. I was in London last week, and I'm sitting on an airplane, and my assistant is beside me, and on the opposite side of him is what I didn't know then, but I now know he's a professional soccer player. I'm talking to my assistant, and actually, he'd made a mistake and said, you really can't do that. And this professional soccer player leans around and he says, that voice. He said, <laughs> I know who you are. I know what you do. And I said, 
why. He said, your voice carries something. He said, all, and he, he was a believer. And I don't even know about it. I have no clue. I'm just who I am. I tell about God. I tell his stories. But you, right, you had that hunger, but yeah. then what, well, tell me the time that it just increased the power where people sensed it, where you, where, where, where you just had that favor with God. Well, after hunger comes an encounter. If you handle the encounter properly comes favor. And that's what happened in my life. I tell people, you know, we talk about my past. If I knew what created the favor, I would have pushed those buttons 20 years earlier. Of course. But it's not about me. So the fact that it's not about how you smart know I am. You know what? I believe if you had pushed those buttons 20 years earlier, you might have failed the test. You That's needed right. the gray hair That's and the experiences. <laughs> <laughs> well, experience births, births uh, humility because you realize you're not the one that created or caused that moment. I had an incredible encounter with God and everything in my life, it's now, instead of shouting uh, and people still not listening, I can speak quietly and but, but people listen. Tell, tell me when this was and if you have any idea of the ingredients that caused it. Sid, I would be remiss to sit here and tell you there's a formula. There's not. It's not about an equation. It's about a relationship. If I have to enumerate, if I have to take I'll a tell you what, paper, hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment. But he is going to tell you how you can have intimacy with God, favor with God. We'll be right back after this. Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter here with Tommy Tenney. And just before the break, Tommy, you were saying it's not a formula. You were saying it's a relationship. In other words, you can't say A, B, C, and you will have favor with God. You right. can say A, B, C to have a relationship. These are some of the things that God is looking for. Tell me how we can have this it's relationship. It's like, you know, this is a little program thing of what you and I are talking about. Yes. If everything in a marriage I have to write down and you have to checklist every morning, okay, kiss my wife at the door and make sure of a phone call and do, flowers for a birthday. Yeah. You know, if it's that regimented, it's a ritual and not a relationship. And God refuses. It, it, aren't humans subject to ritual? Don't yes. we love tradition? We, we, we do. In, in fact, of course, same, we Jewish people have a corner on the market, but you Christians have <laughs> taken it a step further than us, I think. Well, we love our traditions. <laughs> it's like you're, you're in church, and at a particular moment, they sing a song. It could have been a year ago, 10 years ago, and you love that song. And the, the next Sunday, you maybe send a note and say, sing that song again. Now, I understand, and the worship leader probably understands too, it's not the song. It's you want that song to take you to the same place it previously took you. But I don't know if you've noticed, Sid, you can sing the same song, but it may not take you to the same place. It's as if God moves the door on you. I know, usually behind us, sometimes there's draperies, like at a hotel, you can't find the opening. You have to run your fingers across the pleat of the veil until you find the opening. And God moves that door on you so that relationship does not deteriorate into ritual that you have to feel after Him every time. That's why women think men are unpredictable to some degree. Men think women are unpredictable. That's the magic of a relationship. And with God, it's the same. When, now I know you've been studying, like myself, the book of Esther for years. It's <laughs> one of my favorite books. But when did it dawn on you there was a correlation between favor and Okay, Look, and looking Esther. for the equation, <laughs> looking for what's really not there. Esther found incredible favor in a hostile environment. Sid, Esther was a, an orphan, which that means that the deck is stacked against her. She was not only an orphan, she's a foster child. Everybody knows foster children don't have half a chance. She was a minority. She was a Jew living in Persia. And in case our viewers don't understand, 
that's ancient Iraq and Iran, right. and the same prejudice that exists today existed then. For a Jewish lady to become queen of Persia, it's unprecedented. But she rose above all of those obstacles. Somewhere between 400 and 1400 other young girls were brought into the palace. How did she get picked? What happened to create that moment of favor? And I thought if I study how Esther operated, you know, maybe I'll figure my wife out a little better. Maybe I can figure out how this whole thing with God. And I found out that she is an incredible, uh, incredible lady. And I've been studying, the, the, the word favor is the repetitive word in the book of Esther. It's found in virtually every chapter. And it's how a peasant girl was plucked up off of a farm, so to speak, placed into a palace, into an unfamiliar environment, learned, and here's the key, she learned the protocols of the palace. She learned how to act in the king's presence, where to walk, where not to walk, what to do, and then rose above that, above all, the Bible says in Esther 2.17, the king loved Esther above all the women, so that he placed the royal crown on her head. There came a day, now I do feel the anointing about this, there came a day where Esther walked into that palace a peasant, and she had one encounter with the king and walked out queen. Never underestimate the potential of one encounter. One night with the king can change everything. And there are people that are focused on their problems because their problems are, some, it's health, life-threatening, it's marriage, it's children okay, and drugs. Listen, here's the secret about that. One of the most freeing statements that I've ever discovered, I learned from studying the book of Esther. Sid, people that are watching, you don't need everybody to like you. I want that to sink in. Say that again. You don't need everybody to like you. Your boss hmm. may say it's over. It's, not, it's normally not in the, no, in the listen, five listen. point sermon. You don't need everyone to like you, but go ahead. But listen, your boss may say it's over. Your spouse may say we're through. Uh, your doctor may say, I've done all I know how to do. But one nod from God. What if God were to look your direction and just do this? One nod from God is worth more than an arena's applause from mankind. You don't need everybody to like you. But in terms of what we're talking about with Esther, if the king likes you, it doesn't matter who dislikes you. They cannot control your destiny. But one thing can control your destiny. One nod from God can change the impossible to the how come I couldn't believe it before? It's easy when God gives me favor. We'll be back right after this, and there is a presence of God on Tommy's wife singing from the brand new movie about Esther. We'll, we're going to show a clip from it. We'll be back in just a moment. Don't go away. You're about ready to experience the supernatural. I said, Roth, you're an investigative reporter. We're having so much fun here, I almost missed the break when we came back. My guest is Tommy Tenney, and we are experiencing the supernatural of God. Tommy Tenney is about ready to have a, a major Hollywood motion picture be released on the life of Esther. Uh, Tommy, I, I, as we've discussed earlier, you have studied Esther. You've loved the book of Esther for many years, but there was a point in your life when it was the reality of there is something in Esther that you must use for the world. When did it hit you? Well, I was teaching people about the presence of God, and just as a momentary illustration, it popped in my mind that just as Esther prepared 12 months, she soaked six months in oil of myrrh, 
six months in other spices, 12 months of preparation for one date with the king. But one night with the king changed everything. It changed her destiny, saved her people, brought favor. You have to be ready when it's your turn. Favor is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. What if Esther had said, I don't like myrrh, I want to wear frankincense. And the king may have been allergic to frankincense. There's a protocol. All the history would have been changed. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there's a protocol, there's a way, and there's a little clue in Esther chapter 2, verse 15. Uh, I, I write about it in the book that we're talking about, that Esther listened to the chamberlain. The king's chamberlain told her, it says very plainly, she only wore what the chamberlain appointed for her to wear. That tells me other young girls wore what they want, said what they want, but Esther said, look, here's a guy who's been in the inner chambers. He knows the king better than me. You tell me what to wear. That was one of Esther's secrets. Now, when you made that statement in the church, the line from Esther, one night with the king, what happened? It, uh, it was, I've written 600 pages about Esther since then, two fiction books, a children's fiction book, an adult fiction book, a teaching book, and all the revelation of those 600 plus pages was contained in that little, one little nugget. It just unfolded like a flower. And what does one night with the king mean to our viewers? One night with the king can change everything. And it's about if the king likes you, it doesn't matter who dislikes you. So I've been teaching people about the Esther anointing, is a good way to put it, how to find favor with the king. And everybody understands we need favor in our homes, favor with our children, favor on our job, favor in our finances. We, we need favor. Favor, oh, I, I love this, Sid. Favor can restore in a day what was stolen over a lifetime. <laughs> it's too good you've got to say that again, Tommy. Well, that's, that's some of the little, what I did is when I started studying Esther, I pulled out all the little truths that I thought, okay, she had to have learned this. And I call them protocols. The protocols of the palace, the protocols of the king's presence, and that's one of them, is that favor can restore in a day what was stolen over a lifetime. They had been a disenfranchised people. The Jews were carried captive into Babylon. Babylon was taken over by Persia, second class citizen, so to speak, but it doesn't matter. By the time the day of favor is finished, not only Esther's in a place of favor, but her adopted father Mordecai and all the Jewish nation there in an incredible place of favor. Favor can restore in one day what was stolen over a lifetime but you have to find favor with the king. You know, I found it extremely fascinating when you revealed this historical truth in your book that Adolf Hitler banned the book of Esther for obvious reasons. He didn't want favor on the Jewish people, but I believe He didn't want that, the knowledge of what could happen. But Yes, but I believe there was, uh, th there's like a spiritual scale over the eyes of most Christianity, that they have to understand the mysteries from the book of Esther. How, uh, why this motion picture, this Hollywood motion picture? Now, it's, it's interesting you said mysteries. The book of Esther is the only book of the Bible that the name of God is not mentioned in. And suddenly it dawned on me that although his name is not mentioned, his works are evident. So it's like God steps back and works behind the scenes and he gives us a view of how that happens. Same thing that Jesus did. Whenever Jesus wanted to reveal a truth, Sid, he would conceal that truth in a story, and we call it the parables. I took the same concept, wrote it into the fiction book. It became a movie, and no, this is not a come to Jesus movie. This is a tell the story. Sid, when is the last time you went to a movie? And at the end of the movie, they said, everybody bow your head, raise your hands. Who's going to commit adultery this week? <laughs> Who's going to harbor hate in their heart? It's not done. They don't do that. But they tell the stories, and it moves the cultural value markers. And any battlefield that we abandon, we lose by default. So I'm just telling the story. 
with the values of a hero who stayed faithful, who learned the protocol. And it's about an earthly king, but it points to the heavenly king. Is that the purpose, really? That's the purpose. Who's in the movie? Peter O'Toole, Omar Sharif. I'll tell you what, I believe there is such a presence of God, especially on the music by Tommy's wife, that as you hear this music, backs are going to be healed people that are hurting are going to stop hurting and literally those tears may come for an evening but i promise you joy will come in the morning and many of you will have encounters with jesus let's go out with that clip on the movie one night with the king Mysterious are the ways of the Lord. That he should have raised up my little Hadassah and made her queen. 